In this how-to guide, we're going to be looking at the application Virtual Desktop and how we can stream PC VR games and applications wirelessly to your VR headset. Whilst Virtual Desktop can be used for a multitude of different PC VR applications, we're going to focus very much on Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is obviously aimed at those VR headsets that don't have a display port or no direct connection to the PC. And with most of them, you have the options such as AirLink or Link Cable, or they have their own streaming application. So why use Virtual Desktop? Well, it's under constant development, relatively streamlined, and there are configuration options not normally available elsewhere. In a nutshell, it'll often give you the very best VR performance for wireless streaming. Welcome back to The Sim Hanger. My name's Mark. Thank you very much for watching, and let's get started. In this video, we'll be using the recently released MetaQuest 3, but it applies across the board, including Pico 4 and so on. By default, Virtual Desktop uses Steam VR, so you do require Steam and Steam VR to be installed. However, stay tuned to the channel, as in a follow-up video being published next week, I will show how we can now use OpenXR with Virtual Desktop. This will allow us to bypass Steam completely, and offers the potential for improved performance. And I'll be showing you how to install it on the MetaQuest 3 and Pico 4. We've now reached the bit in the video where you need to pay attention. To use Virtual Desktop with your VR headset, you need to download and install Virtual Desktop directly into the headset. It's available from both the Pico and Meta Store, etc. You'll have to pay for the application, and the cost will vary between 14 and 20 pounds or your local equivalent. As part of your purchase, you'll also get access to the Virtual Desktop Streamer. This needs to be installed on your PC. The cost of this is included in your purchase. You'll also need to ensure that your PC is connected directly to your router via Ethernet. To ensure a good connection, make sure both the headset and your PC are on the same wireless network, so they can talk to each other and transfer the data, etc. Further details are available via the Virtual Desktop website, link in the notes below. Now that you've got Virtual Desktop installed on your VR headset and Virtual Desktop Streamer installed on your PC, let's kick off with having a look at the Virtual Desktop Streamer. And this application needs to be started before you start Virtual Desktop in VR. I recommend that you create a shortcut on your taskbar for easy access and simple left click and it will start and bring up the various settings available. If you don't see anything, it means it's minimized on start. It'll be in your hidden icons. Select the icon, right click and choose settings to bring up this menu. The only thing that we need to concern ourselves with the options tab at this point. My version may look slightly different to the standard version or the version that you install because I'm using one of the beta versions due to the requirement for OpenXR, which I'll be covering in detail in my next video. But other than that, everything else is the same. And as mentioned earlier, Virtual Desktop uses SteamVR by default. First of all, let's have a look at the various codecs that are available. The codec is the method that it's using to transfer the data from the PC to the headset and the type of compression of that data that it's using. Now, all of these are 200 megabit with the exception of H264+, plus, which is a 400 megabit. However, you need Wi-Fi 6 and a fairly strong and stable signal in order to use this. Otherwise, you're going to find the application that you're using is going to be full of stutters and so on. A fairly recent addition is AV1 10-bit for the Quest 3. The advantage that this offers is it does provide slightly better image, better clarity, but at the cost of some latency. So the practicality of using AV1 will again depend on your system. I haven't tested these all exhaustively. And to be honest, the difference between HEVC and AV1, etc., and HEVC 10-bit have been nominal. I can't really see much of a difference. But I leave that for you to experiment with. 
I normally select HEVC or HEVC 10-bit. You can emulate a gamepad and audio streaming, VR headset only, various options are available to you. These are some general localized settings such as start with windows, start minimized in tray and so on and you can set these to suit yourself. But that's it really from the virtual desktop streamer. Let's now jump into VR and have a look at virtual desktop. We're now in the MetaQuest 3 at one of the various home environments. After installing, go to your apps and there you should see Virtual Desktop, click on that and launch. A Virtual Desktop will start. Within the settings of Virtual Desktop you can choose various home environments from floating in a galaxy to this one here which is Office. To bring up the Virtual Desktop menu, press the hamburger key on the left controller or alternatively press any of the trigger buttons away from the screen and that will also bring up the Virtual Desktop menu. We're on the computer tab and the first thing is we need to ensure we are connected to the PC, which we are. My computer is showing 960 megabits per second and I'll normally get anything from 867 megabits per second up to 1200 megabits per second. And as you can see, I'm on the 5 gigahertz frequency, which is what is required to get good connection on virtual desktop. If your frequency is 2.4 gigahertz, then you're going to be limited to 300 megabits per second, which really isn't good enough for Microsoft Flight Simulator and most other applications. You do need the 5 gig. If you have the appropriate fiber feed and Wi-Fi 6, you can get up to 2400 megabits per second. Unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of that at this time. Moving on to the settings tab, you have the option for auto connect, which I recommend and the option to use optimal resolution. What this means is it will change your monitor resolution to match that that's being streamed, potentially putting less demand on your system. The environment quality has no impact on the sim or game that you're playing. It purely impacts on your local surroundings. Frame rate is an important one and this should match what you've set your headset to. And the refresh rate of your headset, be it 72 or 90, equals the same in frame rate, 72 frames per second or 90 frames per second. If you're struggling for performance, turn it down to 72. Personally, I recommend 90 frames per second if your system can handle it. The desktop bitrate is exactly what it says on the tin. And I find good performance at about 30 megabits per second. And it shouldn't be lower than 20 megabits per second in my opinion. Dynamic lighting again has no impact on the app that you're using. And the other one I want to mention is boost clock rates. Very often easy to be tempted to tick this as it brings your CPU in your headset into play but does eat your battery even faster than normal with little to no impact on the FPS you'll experience in game. Let's now move to the most important settings, the streaming tab. And most of these settings will have a direct impact on your experience in sim. First of all, graphics quality. And a variety of selections are available and vary from potato, I'm a potato. through to the highest resolution, godlike. godlike. And for Microsoft Flight Simulator, ultra or godlike really is required to give you the definition you're looking for. However, and it's worth noting that this resolution can be overwritten in the OpenXR Toolkit third-party application from Matt. Potato offers a resolution of 1440 by 1536 and Godlike is 3072 by 3216 per eye and may appear substantially larger than the Quest 2064 by 2208. And Godlike mode will bring you much closer to the expected resolution in the Quest 3. And the same applies to the Pico 4. Now I'm not going to delve into all the technical details for that. Safe to say that the native resolution of an image prior to it being fed into the headset is substantially larger than the panel resolution of the VR headset itself. And that is to accommodate things such as barrel distortion, shape of the lens and so on. So in a nutshell, a much larger image is required to be rendered so that the headset can display the advertised resolution. 
The VR graphics quality that will work for you will depend on your system specs and the game or sim that you're playing. But to address Microsoft Flight Simulator, which is one of the most demanding games from a graphical point of view and certainly from a VR point of view, it's a well-known established fact you need a fairly beefy system and graphics card. The VR frame rate that you said should match the refresh rate of your headset that we looked at earlier under the settings tab. If it was 90 Hz, then you should set it for 90 FPS and so on. The higher the VR bitrate, the greater chance of latency and stutters. And once again, it can be very tempting to push it all the way up to 200 megabits per second. But again, depending on your connection, etc., this may stress the system and cause too many stutters. This would be for you to experiment, but it would be anything in my experience from about 60 megabits per second up to about 120, no higher. Moving on now to synchronous space warp or motion reprojection, you have three setting options, disabled, automatic and enabled. I would recommend you choose either disabled or always enabled and avoid the automatic setting. What SSW does in short is put in artificial frames between actual rendered frames if your VR headset is struggling to achieve the desired FPS. Having it enabled may give you a much smoother performance. Once again, you should experiment with it. If, for example, we're running at 90 FPS and 90 Hz, then the demand on your system is only for 45 frames per second with SSW enabled, the outstanding 45 frames will be artificially generated. This will cause a loss in the quality of the image and certainly in terms of the finer details. But if you're struggling for performance, SSW should be a consideration. The reason I recommend that you don't have it on automatic is that SSW is then kicking in and kicking out on a regular basis. And when it starts and stops, again, depending on your system, of course, but you can find that the number of micro pauses and judders increases. In terms of Snapdragon, this is an upscaling utility and I recommend that you leave that to OpenXR Toolkit. Leave that unchecked here. I do recommend that you have video buffering enabled and also show performance overlay, especially when you're trying to establish performance. And once we jump into Sim, we'll be able to have a look at the overlay itself and see the sort of information that it provides. The overlay is activated by pressing the joystick buttons down on both controllers simultaneously. Do the same again to remove it. Once you are happy with the settings, click on Launch Steam VR as we're now preparing to get into Sim. It'll load Steam initially and then Steam VR. Here you can see the performance overlays also come up. I'll just get rid of that for now. Then using the leftmost button on the left controller, press it to bring up the Steam menu. You will then see the default Steam view. From the menu bar below the screen, select Desktop. I then normally close various applications that have opened. And here we can see Steam VR is running. And we can take a few moments just to check the settings. Under the General tab, we can see that the resolution is 3072 by 3216, which is godlike, which is what we set in Virtual Desktop initially, and our OpenXR runtime is Steam VR. So that is all as expected. I can now close this, and I'll take the opportunity to minimize the Steam VR settings. So I'm now looking at my desktop, and I'm going to select Microsoft Flight Simulator, give it a click, and it starts to run. Just note, we are in big screen mode and not in VR in the sim at this time. What you can do at this time is take the headset off, wait for it to load, set up your flight, get on the runway, headset back on, but first, a few pointers. I know most of you watching this will know this already, but I'm asked so many times. From the main menu, select Options, then select the General Options, then from the menu on the left hand side, select VR mode. Make sure you have keys and buttons for activate, deactivate VR, toolbar toggle and camera reset before entering the sim. Once you've set up your flight, click fly now. We're now in the runway, but note we are still in the big screen mode. This is not Microsoft Flight Simulator VR. 
we can see the Steam world around us. Now select the appropriate button or key to toggle into VR. You'll note your view will change, showing a view of each eye. Using any one of the controllers, pointing away from the screen, press the trigger. And you're now in VR, in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Recenter your position as needed. We'll just get rid of that menu. And we're now ready to go. Or for you to use OpenXR Toolkit in conjunction with your Microsoft Flight Simulator settings to change and tweak things to get a good performance. To exit, it's simply a reverse. Come out of VR mode, close down the sim, you'll be back in Steam, exit Steam VR, close Virtual Desktop, and you're back to Oculus Home. Well, we haven't covered all aspects, but I hope you found this useful and informative and will help get you going. Thank you very much for joining me today. Stay well, look after yourselves. I'll see you all again very soon. And bye for now.